I'm going to tell you my truth, the way I remember. I'm not the most level-headed person. I'm pretty volatile. It was a competition to me, but it was a game of life and death. America was not ready for an Asian hero. His goal was to show the beauty of his culture to the world. Empty your mind. Be water, my friend. The home run chase was a feel-good thing. I didn't know anything about Sam Sosa until he had 20 home runs in June. The mark in 1990 was important. But in retrospect, there was a price to pay for it.
I'm going to tell you my truth, the way I remember. I'm not the most level-headed person. I'm pretty volatile. It was a competition to me, but it was a game of life and death. America was not ready for an Asian hero. His goal was to show the beauty of his culture to the world. Empty your mind. Be water, my friend. The home run chase was a feel-good thing. He didn't know anything about Sam Sosa until he hit 20 home runs in June. Well, Mark and I beat him in the NUSC play. But in retrospect, there was a price to pay for it. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to some. Happy Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and welcome to the first ever Los Angeles Asia Pacific Film Festival Virtual Showcase, presented by Visual Communications. From celebrating our histories and cultures to mobilizing our communities to being socially and politically active, we present the Virtual Showcase to keep us all connected. I'm Tracy Wen Meng. I am the founder and host of the podcast, Vietnamese Boat People. If you haven't heard of it before, you can check it out on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to a podcast. Um, we curate stories of hope, survival, and resilience of the Vietnamese diaspora. It is with great excitement that I present this showcase today. It is brought to you by our partners at Comcast NBC Universal, Sony Pictures Entertainment, Nielsen, HBO, and Warner Media, National Geographic, and of course, community partners, Vietnamese Boat People. You can get more information on vcmedia.org. So today's program is called Being Bao Nguyen. So let me tell you a little bit about Bao before we get started. He is an award-winning Vietnamese-American filmmaker whose past work has been seen in the New York Times, HBO, NBC, Vice, PBS, the list goes on. He has directed, produced, and shot a number of short films, which has been played in numerous festivals, museums across the world. He earned his BA at NYU and his MFA at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. And he's done numerous independent films, commercials, but my two favorites are Live from New York, which chronicles the cultural phenomenon of the show SNL. And the other one is Be Water, which is coming out soon on ESPN in June. And it is a documentary about Bruce Lee. So Bao, welcome to the show. Thank you for being with us today. Of course, thank you for having me. So Bao, I think I wanna start with Be Water. I got a chance to preview it the other day. And um, what I really loved about it was that it wasn't your typical documentary where it kind of chronologically goes through somebody's birth to death. In fact, I think you focus very purposefully on certain segments of his life. And I think you profiled him more than just a talented actor or a martial artist. You profiled him as a game changer in Hollywood. So tell me a little bit more about the film and you know, really the message that you were trying to send to the viewers. So Be Water is a film that I've been working on for about five years now. And um, it came about after my uh, last film, Live from New York, because I was just thinking about how to look at iconic figures, iconic institutions in a different perspective. And um, when you think of icons, especially Asian American icons, you think of Bruce Lee. Um, but I think uh, for many people, Bruce Lee is just a name. He's just kind of this uh, cultural icon figure 
that no one really knows the story about. And part of me wanted to find out who he was as a person to really unpack the myth of Bruce Lee. And so the film kind of delves into more the humanistic side of Bruce Lee, um, talking mostly to people who knew him and uh, not really looking at his legacy so much, um, but looking at his life. I think there's a lot of film, people have a very uh, specific perspective on, on how Bruce Lee has impacted their life. And so I wanted to take a somewhat more intimate look and um, really find out, find out like who he was as a person, to find out like what his struggles were, what his fears were, especially um, the struggles that he had to face being um, an Asian, Asian American uh, in Hollywood in the late 1960s. And the topic is so timely, right? Because I think we're in a period where Asian Americans' um, voices and narratives are becoming a little bit more mainstream. Obviously, there's still obstacles, but um, not only did you ha ha have to do a movie about Bruce Lee, but just the timing of the Asian American story, like that must have been a lot of pressure. It was for sure it's a lot of pressure making a film about um, arguably the most famous Asian American figure uh, in history in a way, um, in modern history. And, um, you know, I didn't try to, to, to approach it in a definitive way. I don't think you can make a definitive film about any subject. And um, I knew that there were a lot of fans and there's a lot of assumptions about Bruce Lee and for me, I, I wanted to make a film that felt, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> somewhat personal uh, to me and my story of how, how I first um, found out about Bruce Lee, how I first, you know, fell in love with Bruce Lee and everything he stood for. And I think, um, again, the Asian American story of Bruce Lee hasn't been told as often as the global icon, the martial artist, the 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 film superstar and um, being an Asian American myself uh, that in a way took off some of the pressure because I, I made a film that I felt like only I could make because I had a, a very specific approach that I I was I held on to throughout the process of the film um, at the same time um, by talking to the people who who knew him uh, most intimately I learned a lot that I wouldn't have gotten from from talking to to someone who could only speak about him in again like uh, a fan uh, point of view or through through his legacy, and um, you know there there are a lot of Bruce Lee documentaries out there, and surely there will be more to come. Uh, so then um, again, this is my take on Bruce Lee. Yeah, I love that you said that because it's it is. Um, his story through an Asian American lens. And I think that is what it was resonated for me and made it different from some of the others that were, have been made. Um, so with that, I actually want to dig into your background a little bit. So you were born in Maryland. Um, I won't mention the year, <laughs> but your parents are Vietnamese refugees, correct? Yes. Yeah, so they, they came here in 1979. And in fact, you made a short documentary about it. I think it was just last year. Uh, yes, I did. Okay. So for you, uh, when you were making that documentary, and I think it was called Where Are You Really From? Um, it premiered in 2019 Tribeca Film Festival. Um, I know that when I was watching the film, your mom had mentioned that your sister was six months old. You weren't born yet. And when they finally fled the country successfully, it was their seventh attempt. Like what an extraordinary story. So did you know about their past before making this short documentary? I mean, obviously I knew that they were part of uh, the quote unquote boat people experience, um, but I didn't know the specifics of their story. Uh, it was always something that I was afraid to ask them because it seems like such a traumatic experience and um, you don't want to bring up and open up these wounds that you feel like maybe your parents have already healed from or they've gotten past. Um, but, you know, I think I was at a period in my life uh, last year and the year before where uh, I knew that 
I, I, I sort of, in a way, had to reconcile a lot of the issues that I had with my parents and and my expectations with them. Um, you know, growing up uh, in an immigrant family, I was born in America. My expectations of of my parents and their obligations as parents are is very skewed because of of the culture, the American culture that I've been growing up in at the time. And um, I felt like in order to have this sort of empathy for where they came from and their journey, I had to find out for myself. And I think as a documentary, you know, when I do documentary films, I expect so much from the people I interview from the subjects that I'm exploring that it would be a bit hypocritical for me to think that I wouldn't be able to explore my own history, my own story. And it was definitely the most personal film that I've ever made. Um, and it's something that I think obviously gave me a deeper appreciation for my parents' journey and uh, gave me that empathy that I was looking for that helped um, heal a lot of wounds, just not not just with my parents, but also within myself and, and how I looked at my relationship with them. Yeah, so I know like the, the history is very traumatizing for some. Um, I mean, even with our podcast, you know, we always get sort of mixed reactions or feelings from people, whether or not they want to share their stories. So when you asked your parents to share their story in this documentary, like what was their reaction? I think they were really willing to do it, which is surprising. <laughs> um, it, Did they know it was going to be publicized for all to see? Yeah, my, my parents <laughs> are a bit of their hands in a way, or maybe I just found <laughs> Um, I told them, yeah, this is a project that I want to do. It's good to kind of like document it. Like, I mean, the funny thing is after I did the film, my parents wanted me, you know, this is how I know that maybe they're actually finally proud of me and what I'm doing. They're like, oh, when are you going to make like a bigger film about our story? (laughs) The whole story in a film, in a feature film. Uh, so hearing that helped ease kind of the the hesitation I had towards asking them in the first place. Yeah. And in that documentary, you had made uh, a statement that you were teased and bullied a lot growing up. So, um, what were you like in high school? Tell us what your childhood was like. Um, I... My childhood or high school, they're very different. <laughs> they're two different things. Yeah, well, let's start with your childhood. My childhood, um, I spent a lot of my childhood with my sister, my older sister, who's about five years older than me. And um, because my parents, they, they were shopkeepers. They ran a small business. They were working from 10 a.m. till you know, close to 9 p.m., six days a week. And... Uh, it was my sister and I really taking care of each other uh, at home. And so my sister and I had a really close relationship. So a lot of the stories, the best memories of my childhood really, uh, you know, emanate from, from that relationship. Um, in terms of other parts of my childhood, I would say I remember working at my parents' uh, store sometimes, usually on the weekends. Um, and they would basically make me work from you know, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and I started working there when I was five years old. And I was, uh, I think maybe this is where some of the resentment came from because as a five-year-old, you know, just starting school and then every day I, I kind of, or every Saturday, I remember like all the kids kind of playing outside and I was just like looking at them from the, back windshield like just drifting away having fun while I'm going to work at the age of five. What did they make you do at five? Uh, So they made me handle the cash. (laughs) (laughs) Were you good at math? (laughs) No I was not and I'm still not good at math but I'm good with money I would I guess. Um, (laughs) I guess they made me my my morality and I didn't know how to spend money so I'm like the perfect person to kind of handle the money. Uh, so I was a cashier and, uh, we owned a fabric store at the time. So my, my sister was, she was the one who cut the fabric. So she would write up all these invoices. She'd cut the fabric, write the invoice for the customer and they would come 
to the cash register and give me the invoice and the fabric. And I, at, at first, you know, if you saw like a little five-year-old meat boy behind a register, you're like, oh, that's so cute. But I was the one, you know, taking the money. So at first they, they wouldn't believe that I would be the one ringing them up. And I would just like sometimes just grab the invoice from them when they were like hesitant. And then I would just like go really fast and just blow their mind. Um, <laughs> I can just imagine you with like a pencil in your ear, <laughs> one of those hats and exactly. a little, <laughs> a little note, notebook on my <laughs> pocket. Um, and so, you know, they were most, if not everyone is really impressed to see this little Asian boy uh, ringing them up. And after a while I, you know, I got a tip from one person and I was like, oh, I can like make more money doing this. So I put a tip jar in front of a <laughs> cash register and got a little extra money. Of course, my parents took it, but it's okay. Um, See, there you go. Good with money. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I would be the one counting the cash at the end of the night too. So, uh, so what about high school? What was high school like? Uh, so high school, let me think. High school was a little difficult because my parents had just gotten divorced um, when I was in seventh, eighth grade. And, you know, the transition of going into high school and a lot of my best friends had gone to different high schools. They just ended up in different high schools. So I felt kind of really out of place my freshman year. And um, it took me like till sophomore, junior year to really hit my stride. Uh, but I, you know, I fell in love with doing art. I would like be one of those art students that would stay uh, in the studio during lunchtime and just like work on my art project. And then after a while, like all the other art students would just join me. Um, but I also remember being kind of, I don't know, I, don't, I didn't own like a rice rocket or anything. I, <laughs> I, was, I was like on the cusp of like being um, part of like the Asian pride group. Uh, but I, I kind of dabbled in all the different groups. Uh, I was lucky in Maryland. I, I grew up in a place called Silver Spring, which is right outside Washington, DC. And it was really diverse city, um, considered one of the most diverse cities in America, actually. And, um, that, that upbringing really, uh, informed how I interact with people and how I, you know, just view community in the world. And so I, I, I was, I think I was like cool with all the groups. Um, Cause I was, I, at the time my sister was living in New York. So I was trying to somehow find my way to New York going through college university. And so I studied pretty hard. And then I'd also join all the, you know, extracurricular groups like most, uh, most Asians did, not to sound like Andrew Yang, <laughs> being too stereotypical, generalizing anything. Um, so did you always want to be in the creative field? Like, did you always want to make films? Not at all, actually. Uh, I think I was always on the path to either being a doctor or a lawyer or some profession that had, quote unquote, stability. And um, Was that your parents' influence? I don't want to say, of course, but there is, you know, obvious reasons where you, you kind of see your parents as immigrants and you see them working, you know, 10 to nine almost every day. And you're like, you want to find a job. I don't know if a doctor or a lawyer wouldn't work as hard as that, but I find a job that pays quite well and that has stability. And um, but I think I maybe put that burden on myself too, because I don't, I think there was like any explicit conversation with my parents. It's kind of like that nuanced parent parental thing where they just like shame you without actually telling you anything. I know. Um, Sometimes it's just a look, but that was enough. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I think, you know, in hindsight, looking at my childhood and, and the things that I did. So going back to when I was a cashier, um, you know, I, it was like the early 90s or late 80s and um, there weren't iPads. My parents weren't going to buy me like a Game Boy or really any toys. So the only thing that I had to keep myself occupied were these invoices that people would give me. Like, so the back of these invoices were, were blank and uh, there was like a pen on the table and I would end up just sketching and drawing for 
you know, eight, nine hours uh, nonstop. So by the end of the day, the, the, the trash bin next to the cash register was just full of my sketches and drawings. And again, looking back at it now, it's just like a kid trying to occupy himself. But I was like drawing out scenes of stories and they were like whole things with beginning, middle and ends. Like, and, and it looks, as a filmmaker, now I realize I was like storyboarding. And um, that I think fueled my creative side in a way that uh, I don't, I wouldn't know how else I would have gotten, I would have tapped into that. Um, so I think after doing all those sketches and I would just be more, I guess, proactive and take initiative on certain class assignments. Like I remember in fourth grade, we had, um, we had a, a assignment to sell something, which is very American, right? It's just like a capitalist. <laughs> For like a nine-year-old. <laughs> For a nine-year-old, yeah. Um, and, um, and I ended up making a commercial. Like I, I got my, <laughs> my neighbor's video camera, like VHS camera, and I did a Nike commercial. I really wish I could find it now because um, I didn't think, again, going back to your question, like I went to NYU, but I, I wasn't thinking of going to Tisch, their film school. And that's because I thought at the age of 17, it was too late for me to be a filmmaker. I, I didn't remember that commercial I made in, when I was nine. It wasn't like, you know, we think of like Spielberg or J.J. Abrams or Paul Thomas Anderson, and they kind of are cinephiles at the age of four or something. And I felt like 17 was too late for me. Um, so I didn't go to Tisch and I, I kept on pursuing the, you know, the, the law degree. And um, yeah, over time, when I had electives that were free uh, at NYU, I would I would take classes at Tisch and I would kind of uh, satisfy that creative urge in me. So when did you make the switch? Because I, because you were studying to be a lawyer. I mean, that's like drastically different. So at what point were you just like, forget it, <laughs> I'm going to go after my dreams? Well, it was, I was still studying for my LSAT. I was like doing all the things I needed to be to be a lawyer. I was, I wanted to be international law um, attorney or human rights law. And so I, I joined AmeriCorps after I graduated college. I went to the Peace Corps for a little bit. I, I worked at NGOs. I did everything that I thought was like, okay, on paper, I'd be like the best candidate for like one of the top five law schools. And I studied like nonstop for six months and like the day that I was taking, gonna, gonna take my LSAT, I was sitting in my car, the engine was on, and I just like looked in the rear view mirror. It's like, do I wanna be a lawyer for the rest of my life? And you know, it was just a split second decision. I just turned off the engine and I went back to bed and I didn't take the LSAT and I didn't tell my parents I didn't take the LSAT. I, I just felt this creative urge in me to, to not be a lawyer and just to pursue something different. And I knew film, like visual arts was always my passion. So how did you get started from there? Like what happened next? Like, did you then just kind of change your field of studies? Uh, so I think at that time I was like four or five years out of college. I'd worked like three or four jobs. Um, and this was maybe around 2008 when like the Obama campaign, his first presidential campaign was starting up. And it was, there was so much energy in it. And uh, growing, again, growing in Silver Spring, Maryland, right outside DC, I always had that political urge in me. And I decided like to, to work in the Obama campaign because I felt like that was like a movement that could never be replicated. It was historical. And I had this, this kind of sabbatical between like knowing I didn't want to be a lawyer, but not knowing exactly what the next step I was going to take in my path. Um, so I worked on, I volunteered for the Obama campaign. And, um, and I think, you know, some of my friends like called me the golden boy because I kind of find myself in the right place at the right time. And it was really tough to like, I, I would have volunteered for the whole campaign but it's nice to become like an official staff person and get a job and get paid. And, you know, as a volunteer, like one day I was like registering people and I hadn't registered voters like all day. And I finally, someone was registering 
and like my 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 quote unquote boss of the Obama campaign happened to walk out at that moment and saw me like registering someone to vote and they just like nodded their head like yeah like you got this and so <laughs> <laughs> two weeks later, I got offered a job to work for the Obama campaign. And uh, it, it probably, you know, again, if I was like not registering anyone, it's like, I, I really feel for campaign workers, for volunteers, because canvassing, you know, red, voter registration, it's, it's a very thankless job. Yes, and, and uh, you have to believe in the cause and the exactly. mission and who you're supporting. And I definitely believed in, in uh, then Senator Obama's cause. Uh, so yeah, I, I joined the campaign and, uh, you know, it was a, it was a really kind of revolutionary campaign in terms of technology and the message. And at that time, social media was picking up, people were making more videos. And so I just happened to, to work on some videos for the Obama campaign that really sparked my interest again. And it wasn't until, you know, after, uh, president, you know, president Obama became, President Obama in 2008, I was like, okay, maybe I could like work in the White House you know, <laughs> doing video or doing something inside the White House. And at the, you know, after he won, I think everyone wanted to work for the Obama administration. There were like 300 jobs and something like, you know, the applicants were in the six figures. So it was, I, apparently it was easier to get into Harvard than to get a job at the Obama campaign or the Obama administration. And uh, I, I thought I could get a job and I ended up being offered a job like at the Department of Labor. And I was like, <laughs> I that. so I was like, what's the next path? And, and again, I always had this passion for politics and activism. How can I kind of marry my love for the visual arts and, and activism? And I was just like looking at graduate schools. I wanted to get back into school and really formalize my my training. And I wanted to get back to New York as well. And so, uh, you know, I looked into going back to NYU. I looked at Columbia. And then I found this new program at the School of Visual Arts called the Social Documentary Film Program. And it was actually their inaugural year, their first year. And um, I felt like, you know, I wanted... For me, I'm, I don't pigeonhole myself. I'm not dogmatic about what type of films I want to make. It depends on the type of story there is. So, um, but At that I, point, did you have any idea of the types of stories or films that you wanted to create? Not, not specifically. I mean, I think on, in general, it's, it was films that had some sort of message that said something about society or people underrepresented or marginalized communities, um, but nothing specific. Um, and so, yeah, it's social documentary film was kind of the perfect, like this, this program seems like made for me. And um, so I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't end up to going to like NYU or Columbia because they focused more on fiction and narrative filmmaking. And I felt like if I learned documentary filmmaking, it would be an easier transition to do uh, like narrative and scripted and narrative and scripted were the type of films that I was making at NYU when I was taking the elective courses. So I figured like documentary is kind of a nitty gritty, like sometimes you have to be the director, the editor, the uh, cinematographer, the, the sound person, like you have to really know all aspects of filmmaking to be successful. And I felt like that was a, better crash course into filmmaking than than going into just scripted fiction uh, films. Yeah, and then you had spent some time uh, living and working in Saigon too, right? It, was that after school? Uh, yeah, it was a couple years after graduate school that I decided to kind of leave New York and then uh, try my luck over in Vietnam. Yeah, and have you always wanted to go back and work in Vietnam or how did that come about? So the first time I ever went to Vietnam was 1992. I was really young and this was before, you know, the embargo was lifted and uh, diplomatic relations were reestablished. So it was a very different Vietnam from what it is today. And um, I fell in love with it. I was really young. And it was the first time my parents had gone back after they left. It was, it was really emotional because it was the first time they were seeing their family. It was the first time I was meeting 
most of my family. And so after that trip in 92, my family, you know, my parents and my sister, we would go back every couple years. It was, it became kind of a family tradition. And, um, you know, I, I became friends with my cousins, hung out with them a lot, really started to feel the energy of the city of Saigon. You've seen it kind of grow. Totally, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's strange because um, I still have a place in Saigon. Um, and it, it was, it's a block away from where I first stayed when I was there in 1992. So it's interesting to see it come full circle. Uh, but yeah, I mean, every two years, especially after the reestablishment of relations with the U.S., mm -hmm. it just exploded in terms of development. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I never thought I was going to live there necessarily. I always uh, figured, okay, this is kind of me trying to reconnect with my roots, hang out with my family. And it was around 2010 that a friend of mine, Stefan Gauger, uh, who was a, a filmmaker I really admired, he made Out in the Sparrow, which is one of my favorite films uh, set in Vietnam. And he was making his second film called Saigon Electric, Saigon Yo in Vietnam. Um, and he was looking for uh, you know another cinematographer to work with. And he was like, do you want to spend the summer shooting this film in Vietnam? And I was like, why not? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, I ended up spending the summer there and uh, first time working in Vietnam. And after working on the film, I got like all these job offers and all these opportunities opened. And it became a lot more feasible for me to, to live in Vietnam instead of just go there as, as, as a family mem member visiting other family members. Um, and what's so, film, what's sorry? What's the film industry like in Vietnam? Um, right now, it's really picking up. It's it's after China and India. It's one of the most uh, highest growth markets in terms of of uh, exhibition, like screens opening, and because of that, the production is quite high. I remember, like in two thousand ten, when I first went there to work. There was about like eight to 12 local films being made there. And now like, it's like 60 or something. So in, mm -hmm. this is been 10 years. Do you find that um, like artists or filmmakers in Vietnam, I mean, they must still feel like they don't have the freedom to express their stories or their narratives the way that they want to. I mean, just given sort of like the government screening of everything. Yeah, there's definitely some frustration in terms of um, censorship, but I think sometimes it it motivates a lot of filmmakers and artists to kind of work their way around it. When you have a restraint on something, you, you find ways to get creative, um, but it's definitely frustrating because I think a lot of filmmakers, when they're even writing their script, they're self-censoring themselves because they don't know what they can eventually show. There's, it's not standardized, uh, it's not uniform. And so it's very subjective. And I think that's very frustrating. I mean, I, I produced a film, Rom, um, last year that, you know, we were really excited. The filmmaker had worked on the film for seven years. It was his first feature. And the whole Vietnamese film industry was really excited about this film. And it ended up getting you know, uh, censored. Luckily now it's past censorship, but it was a long journey. Uh, but it definitely hinders, I think, uh, creativity among uh, young filmmakers. But I, again, this is a system that they've always known. Mm -hmm. So um, it's easy for me in a way as an outsider saying, oh, in America, we can do what we want in terms of creative creativity. But, um, you know, again, sometimes when you have restraints, that's where the greatest creativity comes from. Mm -hmm. I, I actually want to read a quote in that film you made, uh, Where Are You Really From? Your self-documentary. So you wrote, in America, I feel Vietnamese, but everywhere else, I feel American. So I think a lot of Asian Americans feel that way as well. Um, can you elaborate on that statement, what you were trying to say? 
it's just funny like that statement comes from like a drunk night in paris in a way um because I, I was hanging out with like my very parisian friends and they're just you know they they just tell me oh you're so american you're so american and they mean it in a, kind of a demeaning way but i was like that's like the greatest thing that you can tell an asian american <laughs> sometimes like that they're so american and i just remember i was like this is amazing just like feel ownership over that identity like that you know maybe on the outside people don't know exactly what I am they question that but if there's a way that I express myself when I travel or when I'm in a different country and people identify that clearly as American there's a sense of pride in that for me because like like I was saying in that quote when you're in America like uh, we we will wear our race on our face right um and and it's 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 the country's so diverse that you can't you know you either kind of own up to like where you came from or where you are now and um you know i had this that long conversation with my friends in france where you know you that is also a very diverse society and a lot of different immigrant communities, but you eventually become French. There's not like the hyphenated American or mm -hmm. just like there is here. It's, you know, you might've come from Morocco, you might've come from Vietnam, but you're the term like Vietnamese, French, French Vietnamese is not very common. It's like you're French, but I, I particularly, you know, am appreciative of, I don't like the idea of the hyphen. I think it's just just get rid of the hyphen. But like the idea of being an Asian American, a Vietnamese American, because it it helps you um, identify with both the places where you came from again, where you're going. And I remember this another conversation I had with this um, woman in the Obama campaign. She was a volunteer who her you know she's half, half Belgian, half Greek, and she lived in London. And she had come to America, you know, paid her way to America to volunteer for the Obama campaign. She's not a citizen. She can't vote. And I was just like, why are you coming to, like, help out an election for someone you have no kind of, like, who in a way has no authority um, and, or, you know, she's not, he's not governing the UK. Obviously, in hindsight, America in for better or for worse or whatever way you want to look at it is considered the leader of the free world so that's why it was so important that obama won or who the president is but she told me something really that really resonated with me that you know she can't go to to england and become english like there is this very certain identity and certain like history of england that goes back for centuries America is a very new country. It's, you know, 400 something years old. And um, I mean, this is obviously gets into the weeds of Native Americans and, and that situation. But if you're talking about the birth of the country, America, and the nation of America, that is something that's a new identity. It's, it's a continuingly formed identity. And that if you come to America, you you start to change what the idea of being American means. And that was something that always made me think of like, yeah, that's that's the beauty of America. Um, and some people have exploited it in a very dark and, and, and you know, uh, a way that doesn't stand for what I believe America is. But uh, again, it's interpretive and experimental and I think that's what makes it beautiful and it's progressive like America the term is progressive um and when she's told me that it's like okay there's something beautiful about that identity of America that if she came to America eventually she can become American because of what it means to be American yeah and I do I do always wonder why we still have that hyphen like we don't call people who have the generations born in America, we don't call them Irish Americans. So when we have, you know, Asians that um, generations later, three, four generations born in America, like Chinese Americans, we're still calling them Asian Americans. So it's very, it's very interesting to me as well. Um, I think in your f short film with your parents, 
they were also talking about whether or not they identify themselves as Vietnamese or Vietnamese Americans or Americans. Um, I'm curious, like, ha has your parents seen any of your films? Um, Other than that one? <laughs> they, I mean, <laughs> the I short talk about them. <laughs> sure they good. I mean, I, just bringing up that film really quickly, they, in the film, they, when I asked them that question, do you feel more American or do you feel more Vietnamese? I was very surprised by the answer because my mom says she feels American. Yeah. And my dad feels Vietnamese and my dad is much more assimilated than my mom because he took English classes when he first arrived and my mom feels ethnic culturally more Vietnamese. And so, yeah, that, that answer always threw me off, but it's again, it's again, this um, kind of uh, pollination of our identity uh, that is interesting. Um, but to answer your question about whether they've seen the film, my films, they've seen that film and they've seen Live from New York. Um, it's a funny story with Live from New York is that um, we had the honor of being the opening night film of the Tribeca Film Festival a few, few years back. And um, my parents who both kind of traveled back and forth between Vietnam and the States, they were living in Vietnam at the time. So I flew them over to New York City for the premiere. And uh, because it's like the opening night of Tribeca, it's a big gala opening in a 3,000 seat theater, the Bacon Theater, which is a beautiful theater. And um, it's also like $350 a ticket because it's like a benefit. And so my mom, she was like looking at the capacity of the theater, like starting to count how many people were there, like 3,000 people, and then looked at, my, at, the, at the ticket and she's like, oh, like 350 times like 3,000. That was going to be like rich. <laughs> That's like the first thing she said. She surely didn't understand the movie that much, but then she's like, oh, so you're gonna make a lot of money tonight. I was like, okay, that's, that's, it feels like, okay, I finally like over there, so feel a sense of pride for my parents, even though <laughs> not, that, that, not of money. So I know, that's that film, super then, cute. Yeah, that's, that was, that's like the, I don't want to take them to any other film after that, because that's like the best, like Robert De Niro introduced me. It was like, I can't really, uh, certain, and did they uh, know who he was? My, I'm sure my sister like whispered, "Oh, he's famous or rich." <laughs> <laughs> my dad knew, knows who he is. Um, but yeah, it's like uh, nothing can top that. So everything else will be a disappointment. So I, I can't take them to anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I also watch uh, "We Gonna Be All Right," which is uh, a four-part digital series. Um, that you did, and I think it was based on the book written by writer Jeff Chang. Um, in episode two, the title was, Is Hollywood Finally Diverse? So I'd like to ask you that question. Do you think Hollywood is finally diverse? You know, it's, Jeff and I have like this question about the term diversity too, um, because like, diversity is really relative to who's saying it, right? Like, um, what's diverse if I'm in a room full of Vietnamese people? We're all Vietnamese. That's not diverse for me because that's kind of my people. Uh, so I, I think the question is like, is Hollywood more inclusive, right? Um, it's more inclusive, but that doesn't mean it's, the equity has been reached where it represents like, what society is and how we live. I think uh, there's definitely still a struggle for that. And um, I'm not cynical to think that yet yeah, times haven't changed and that there are more opportunities, but I think there has to be a lot more work to be done. And uh, you can't kind of sit idle thinking, oh, it's diverse, we're done. We've kind of reached the mountaintop. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, a constant battle. Do you think um, in order to move the needle, at least for Asian Americans in Hollywood, is it better to be in front of the camera or behind the camera? Uh, it's hard to say because each of, they're, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, you can't have people in front of the camera without having people kind of not just behind the camera, but like controlling the whole set, right? People in power who are writing the stories or like green lighting the projects. And obviously representation on screen, there's a certain level of 
of, uh, of power to that, um, being able to like spread your message in a very vast way, uh, immediately. I think Bruce Lee actually to go back to be water. He recognized the fact that, um, and when he first arrived to America again, uh, in, in the late 1950s, early 60s, he wanted to kind of teach people his Chinese culture, his Asian culture by, by, by uh, being a martial arts instructor, by being a Kung Fu instructor. But then he soon realized like the power of television, the power of media to, to spread the same message of, of the beauty of, of Asian culture. And um, I think the people in front of the camera do that in such a in a way that the people behind camera wouldn't be able to express to a wider audience and you know representation matters in in all aspects i would say um, because when you show someone who looks like you on screen you see yourself in many ways right you resonate with that story you can be a hero you can be anything you want um, but in addition to seeing yourself on screen when other people see you on screen when African Americans, when you know white Americans, Latina, Latinx Americans, see like a strong Asian American, then they realize like, oh, they're not so different. There's a sense of familiarity and a sense of um, community in that. And I think that's something that sometimes we forget. We always think like, oh, it's incredible from an internal standpoint that we get to see ourselves on screen. But it's being able for the whole world to see us as well. When do you think that Asian American actors or actresses will finally be able to play roles that were not specifically written for an Asian American actor? Like, uh, I mean, it's it's like a case by case thing, right? I, I, there are cases where that happens. I know, like, you know, Andrew Ahn is a filmmaker friend of mine, and he did this really great film, Drive Ways, um, and that film has Hung Chao in it. So uh, originally, you know, it's about a, a mother and a son who, well, I don't think they were written in a certain way, but Andrew's like, oh, can they just be Asian? And <laughs> and they ended up being Asian. And that wasn't necessarily like a big part of the narrative of the film, but it was just like a decision that's like, okay, why not, right? Yeah. Um, and I think maybe in a way, uh, when people stop asking that question is when we've made it, right? When yeah, it becomes irrelevant. About inclusion, diversity, that, yeah, then we subconsciously have made it. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, you know, given your parents' uh, background as refugees and, you know, kind of growing up in a very um, immigrant childhood um what do you think about your childhood and all of that background like how has it influenced you in films or even as a director or has it had any influence let me think about that um i, don't, I mean it just informs who i am as a person right I, I never think about it as like oh this is all of that has formed how I'm going to make films. It's just like for me as a person and, and through osmosis in a way, it's made me the filmmaker I am. Um, I think I try to be as empathetic as possible in the way I live and care about those around me and think about community and be sensitive to what, you know, people's experiences were. Um, and maybe that's come from being an immigrant and, and having been affected by a lot of external forces that have, have you know, have, have changed uh, the way I think about other communities, marginalized communities, underrepresented communities. Uh, but uh, I can't kind of say specifically that that is like, there's a pinpoint moment. I, I do think all, yeah, the, the sum of all my, experiences growing up in my life that uh, have informed me. I, I, I don't try to um, think that, yeah, that, that I, I shy away from that. And um, I think it's also informed my, in a way, the way that I want to approach the, my future work too, is that 
I can, I can break away from my own experience that I can be something more than that as well. Um, like the poet Ocean Bloom says that sometimes writers and artists of color are expected to navigate our stories and our histories for the mainstream white culture, white society, instead of being able to, um, to be entrusted to kind of build our own world. We're tour guides to our world, but can't be world builders. He said something on those lines. And that's always stuck with me because uh, it shows that, okay, we can use our story uh, because everyone uses their story, but that isn't the only story that we're allowed to tell. Yes, absolutely. But speaking of telling stories, so do you think you will ever make a film about your parents' story? Um, <laughs> don't hold me to that. They might watch this and be like, well, you said this. This is, this is where the LSAT training, the, the lawyer training, like, don't say anything, don't answer the question unless, you know, I'm re- prepared to really back it up. Um, I mean, I, I do think that story in general, the story of refugees, of the Vietnamese experience coming and leaving, coming to America or coming to a new land, leaving their old homeland, is a story that I'd, I'd love to tell. And there's so many people already telling that story as well. And um, I think uh, if I have the opportunity to tell it, I wouldn't, I would jump at it. But, I, you know, s- sometimes people think like, oh, why do you want to tell a story that's so uh, sad and depressing? But I think um, it's important for our community um, to build this mythology that hasn't been formed by us. It's been formed by Western lens, the Western lens of, of our experience through, through the lens of the American soldier, through the lens of, mm-hmm. of the American war and not so much the lens of the diaspora. Uh, so I think it's important that uh, for future generations and in our own generations, because again, like it took me till last year to ask my parents this story, that this mythology helps uh, solidify who we are as as a as a group as a as a you know part of the American story. So you've you've done two iconic films, <laughs> SNL and Bruce Lee. Um, I don't know of any one filmmaker that gets that lucky early in their career. Um, so what's next for you? Can you share? I'm gonna make a film about Jesus now. What's the- <laughs> Um, uh, so I've been reading a lot, um, in this really strange time for, for the world. Uh, it's given me a chance to slow down and, and catch up on a lot of things after working so long on the Bruce Lee project. Um, I've been reading a lot of, uh, Vietnamese American writers and, um, and kind of seeing what's out there in terms of source material. Cause I think, uh, as a filmmaker, I kind of look to all different um, parts of culture, do books, do music, and and see what inspires me. So I've 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 read a lot of things that really feel personal and honest to my story, but at the same time, that's very unique to to whoever wrote that story. And and so yeah, I'm trying to develop these projects into something that can be part of um, really the culture the part a fabric of American culture. Like I think it's there's there's a lot of communities who've who've been able to create great works of art and films and T V series that have 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 really uh cemented the idea of what the American family is, what the American story is and um that's something that I really want to work on. And so those type of projects, scripted projects, TV series, and then I have a few documentary series that I'm developing as well. Um, I never want to like say exactly what I'm working on because uh, no specifics. You, know, yet. you don't know when it, it's going <laughs> to fail. It's not an easy profession that I've chosen. So um, hopefully, something will come out. Of- <laughs> so, what advice um, do you have for other? Um, creators or filmmakers or directors just starting out in their career like they're in their early 20s just trying to figure it out what advice do you have for them 
I would say try to look within your story, your own stories and find something honest and authentic um, and that you know. I think it might be kind of contradictory to when I was like quoting Ocean, but um, when you're just starting out, it's, it's nice to kind of land on your feet and just and and work on something that you feel like you know a lot about um and that you have the support system making films is really difficult um try to find people uh, peers that you want to work with that are also aspiring and emerging and by building that community you kind of grow up together you progress together um you know it's ironic that we're talking as part of the you know LA Asian Pacific Film Festival. That was the first film festival that I ever showed my work. Um, I guess it was like 11 years ago. Um, and and it was the first time that I really met a community of filmmakers, Vietnamese filmmakers. So I was living in New York and um, it's, kind of, it's quite scattered the creative community there. But here because of Orange County and just like festivals like this, um, you can really coalesce around a group of people that will always have your back. Like Stefan is someone I met at this festival. Um, Anderson Lay, Kenneth Wynn, like uh, Ham Chun, like these are filmmakers and, and people that I've always uh, collaborated with since I became a, became a filmmaker. And now we're, we're starting our own company based in Vietnam and in the United States called East Films. And we've, yeah, we've kind of grown up together. I mean, when when I first started out, Ham had done Journey from the Fall and, you know, Stefan had done Al the Sparrow. I never saw uh, that I could kind of be on their level. And now they've become, you know, sadly Stefan passed away a few years ago, but they were always great mentors to me. And I think it's important to, to like look within your community of like who who you can build uh, a crew with and and kind of like keep on making films and make things that feel honest and intimate and look within your own life for these stories because there are plenty of stories you don't have to go to another country another continent to find something interesting it's, it's sometimes right in front of you that's great advice um, we're almost out of time so I did want to save the last two minutes to do some lightning round questions with you. Have you done lightning rounds before? Not on live broadcast. <laughs> podcast, so let's see. Well, it, it's, um, we're going to do six questions in 60 seconds. So just the first answer that comes to mind. And it's just so our viewers can get to know you just a little bit more than what they've already seen. Um, so first question, are you ready? Sure. <laughs> What's your favorite Vietnamese food? Um, Tit Ka. What's the last book that you've read? Uh, Saigon by Phuc Dun. What do you prefer, making documentary films or feature films? I can't answer that because I love <laughs> them. <laughs> what bad habit did you pick up during this quarantine? Oh. Watching reruns of Top Chef, like over and over, like the same episode sometimes. What's your favorite movie of all time? Ooh, God, uh, Bicycle Thieves. Oh, what's that? I've never even heard of that. The Italian neorealist film. I'll have to check it out. Um, and last question, vodka or gin? Gin, well, whiskey <laughs> actually, but if I had two choices, I'd pick gin. <laughs> All right. Well, great. That's all the time we have today, Bao. Thank you so much for being with us on today's program great. and sharing very personal stories about yourself. I thought the lightning round would get more personal, so I'm glad that it didn't. I know. I should have. Darn it. <laughs> um, so thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. On Saturday, please check out the Cinema Sala uh, Presents uh, Cine Diaz on Fireside Chat with filmmaker Ramona Diaz. And for more information on visual communications, please check out the website vcmedia.org. Bye, have a good day. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, Bao. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.
Thank you.